Hello, I'm Kevin. Hello on Zoom. Uh, and I'm an English UX writer here at Wix. Um, and this talk is called uh, Me, Myself, and Localization. Uh, it's going to be about how localization helps me as a UX writer. Um, but I hope you, know, you can come away with some ideas about how it can also impact your own work. First, I'm going to shamelessly use a family photo to win you over. Um, but no, in addition, uh, I also wanted to use this to show that localization is not just a part of my work and professional life. It also bleeds into my personal life. So I'm uh, born in Canada. I grew up in the US, and then I, I made Aliyah and moved to Israel. So I'm English with some, some bad Hebrew in the end. My wife was born in Georgia, the country, uh, and grew up in Moscow before moving to Israel. So she speaks three languages fluently. Russian, Georgian, and English, and a little bit of Hebrew. And her whole family does not speak English. So my mode of communication is with a localizer. And she will, my wife will not hesitate to tell you that it's one of the keys to a, a happy marriage. Just one of them, just one of them. <laughs> okay, so what am I gonna be covering uh, in this talk? First, I'm going to give a bit of background about myself, my intro to the world of localization, and some of my experiences as an English writer. Uh, we'll get a little technical and talk about uh, the content journey from creation to translation and production. Uh, we'll dip our toes into some academia and talk about some linguistic concepts, um, which are fundamental to understanding the limits and also the possibilities uh, of localizing language. And then we'll finish with something that Rachel already started, um, but will be a common theme through all the talks, which is um, the importance of human connection and open dialogue in successful localization. Uh, first, an uh, inspirational quote um, from Nelson Mandela. Uh, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his own language, that goes to his heart. Um, I think this quote is great, um, not just in terms of localization, but as UX writers, what, what we're trying to do. We're trying to help users understand, comprehend in an easy way, but also we need to meet them where they are. Um, we want to, to meet them wherever they're feeling. So for example, if they're looking at an error message, something probably didn't go, go right, something went wrong, we don't say that, but something happened, they might feel a little down, we want to give them some encouragement that, hey, we've got you, we find a way out of it. Or, you know, they may look at a success message and we want to celebrate with them and, and help them like to keep going. So we want to be moving them forward. And how do we do that? As UX writers, we do that with language. Um, and just breaking this down a bit more in terms of global numbers, there's about 370 million uh, first language English speakers, which is less than about 5%. Um, there, it's not even the top native language spoken, Spanish, there's more Spanish native speakers, there's more Mandarin Chinese native speakers. But when you add on top the 1.1 or so billion other people who speak English, not as their first language, it gets up to about one and a half billion, which is about one in every four people um, in the world. So that still means that there's 75%, almost six billion people who don't speak English at all. So in terms of impact of our words, localization, it has a huge, huge role. Okay, so let's start going into a bit of my background. Uh, I started at Wix about seven and a half years ago, um, not as a UX writer, but actually as a content writer for what at the time was uh, a new Wix website generator called ADI over here on the left. Laura was my teammate, Rachel was my team lead for a long time. So basically users could choose a website or business type, answer a few questions, and we would generate a, a website with them full of content for them. So text, images, videos, uh, which they could then edit and update, but basically it was a site ready to publish. So in terms of the content that we, me and my teammates worked on, it involved more than 18,000 strings of uh, words for business terms, so that answers that question I showed you before, what kind of website are you trying to build? Uh, more than 23,000 strings uh, connected to sitemaps, so those are like the page names and the section names on the, on the website the user received. And more than 100,000 strings of 
uh, site content. So these are the titles, subtitles, body text, and CTAs of the site. Um, a lot of text, huge amount of, uh, of text, I think more than a million words. Um, but for almost two years, ADI was only in English. And I remember Rachel came up to me one day and she goes, so we're thinking to localize ADI into Portuguese. Do you want to go to Brazil and hire a team of freelancers? Freelance translator said, well, of course, well, why not? And basically I dove headfirst into the world of localization. You know, we had to set up the training, we had to set up the workflow, um, we had to maintain and monitor and do QA, handle putting, putting content in lang languages into production. It was a, a huge effort. Um, initially we did 12 languages in two different phases. Um, and then we also added eight more for just the, the business terms that we localized. So it was a great experience in, in really learning firsthand the, the challenges um, of localizing both, both personal challenges, working with people from far away, far distances, with different levels of experience, um, but also in terms of managing a project like this, of this scale. Now I'm a UX writer um, for a company at Wix called Wix Home where I work on the dashboard, both on the desktop and the owner app, owner mobile app. Um, and it's not, a, not really a vertical, it's more of a horizontal. We serve as a platform for other uh, vertical writers to use our real estate. Um, there is some that's unique to Wix Home, but we also help, you know, bookings add a setup step for their website or stores to add a suggestion for their users and things like that. Um, but I do get to work with UX writers across Wix, which is something I, I really love doing. And the, the dashboard is localized on desktop to 21 other languages and on the owner app to 22 languages. Okay, so with all this background and experience, uh, I've come to understand the, the journey my content, content takes um, and the type of control I have as a writer. So I think you should start and ask like what do you know the path your content takes from creation to production? Um, from just being like an idea and then some words on a document to being live and seen by, by your users. This was a slide I created uh, when I was doing onboarding for, for new team members in ADI. It's overwhelming, that's the whole point. In white you have the flow of content in English going from Google Doc into CMS and then GitHub is involved and there's processes to get it into, into the live production. And then on the bottom you have kind of a parallel uh, thing going on with languages, but lots of moving parts. This was usually the reaction I would get um, when I would show this, and then usually followed by something like this, a migraine. But I think it's an important, uh, important thing to, to do, to map out the full, no matter how complex it might be, to map out the full picture, because then you can start taking out the key steps and really identifying those points that you can have an impact. Um, so for example, usually the first thing is the creation of the text, whatever you're using, a document, Google Docs, slides, spreadsheet, Figma. Um, and then that content will get into the code somehow. Usually in Wix, this is done with our uh, content management system called Babel. And then in terms of the localized languages, they use the translation management system, SmartLink. Um, but that helps control from the creation into the code. And then there's some kind of content QA where we have like a sneak preview version where we can actually see it and make sure it looks good and, and works well. And then finally, the content is live and open for all users. So how does this help me as a UX writer? First, it helps me stay organized. Um, so one of the, the things I've learned on my journey is that having a single source of truth or sources of truth where anyone who's working on the project can come and get the information they need at any time is, is always a good thing. And it, it does exactly that. It lets anyone, a product manager, developer, designer, localization uh, manager, it lets them find whatever they need um, when they need it. This is just an example of a Monday board that my amazing localization manager, Jacobo, uh, puts together. So he divides everything into a localization task and adds 
and all the information. He adds links to Figmas. He adds GitHub repositories. Any information anyone could need can be found here. On top of staying organized, uh, it really helps me as a UX writer to own my words. So I know where my content is at any moment within the process. And I'm able to, to troubleshoot if something's not going right, or I'm able to make a change and understand the repercussions of that and what other things I might have to do again. Okay, so now I wanna put my professor glasses on uh, and talk a little bit about linguistics. Don't worry, it's not gonna get too, too bad. Um, but I think it's important to introduce some of these concepts so we can understand some of the limitations, but also the possibilities uh, of localizing content. So, nerd alert. So, um, languages we don't speak, like I can tell you from first-hand experience, sitting at a dinner table with my in-laws, they're all speaking some blend of Russian and Georgian. It sounds meaningless to me, right? But all languages do have uh, some similarities. Um, and these characteristics that they share are called language universals. And these are just eight of uh, some of the most, uh, the major ones. But you don't have to read the whole list because I just want to focus on these three. First, you have all languages uh, are symbolic systems. All languages have a basic word order of elements like subject, verb, and object with variations. And all languages have similar basic grammatical categories, such as nouns and verbs. So drilling in a bit more, um, you have a morpheme, which is a minimal unit of meaning in a language. Basically, it's a word or a part of a word that cannot be broken down more in terms of its meaning. So things like site or user would be a morpheme. Or the letter S, because you add a letter S to a word, it becomes plural, it becomes possessive, or it becomes a verb. Um, and then we have syntax, the rules which speakers can use to create phrases and sentences using those morphemes. And then we have glyphs. So glyphs are symbols that convey information uh, non-verbally. Um, this can be, for example, capital A, lowercase a, S. It can be just the accent or a letter with the accent. This is the Georgian letter L, uh, Hebrew the soft sign in, in Cyrillic, so it's not actually pronounced, but it affects the pronunciation of other letters around it. And even emojis, uh, modern, modern uh, addition to glyphs. Uh, even while I was putting this slide together, you know, if you want to check it out yourself, you go to the insert special characters. Those are basically all the glyphs, you, and you can find them all there. So, um, so as UX writers, these concepts are core uh, to the internationalization of the words we of the words we create, but like, what is a real world application? You know, I'm I'm showing you these these kind of concepts. Is there a tool that can turn these concepts into something we can use? Um, and the answer is yes. It's something called Unicode, um, and this Unicode standard it just refers to the standard character sets um, that represent all natural language characters, and it's about 1.1 million characters, um, and it allows uh, developers, anyone building something uh, online um, or digital, to support all of the world's languages and scripts in a single universal standard. Okay, so let's kind of take these concepts and let's put it into a, a, a real world example. This is a, a product that I, I work on that's actually an A-B test right now on the dashboard. It's an activity feed. So we're showing users updates based on uh, activity on their site or their business. Um, and you can see it's, it's based on different categories. And I want to focus in on this one, the subscription canceled, and this text in particular, the show five more updates like this. Um, so the possible text uh, for the different values that this, this piece of text could have are infinite. You can have show one more update like this, two, three, all the way up to thousands, infinity, basically in theory. And the, the classic way uh, to deal with this would be to have two different strings. You'd have a singular, show one more update like this, and a plural string, show X more updates like this. And it works fine. It takes a little bit of uh, developer work to, to make the logic uh, okay within the product, but it, it can work fine. 
It works well in Spanish as well. Um, they have a plural version and uh, more than one version. But in some languages, it causes issues. This is Polish. And they don't just have a singular and a plural. They actually have three different plural versions, uh, depending on rules in their language. Um, like the first plural, I hope I get this right, it, it ends in, it's for numbers that end in 2, 3, 4, except 12, 13, and 14. The second one is for other numbers. The third one is for decimals or fractions. It's, it's just the way it is. So in this case, that uh, idea of using two strings, it doesn't work. So what do we do? This is where ICU comes in, okay? The International Components for Unicode. I put this, this is straight from their website. Basically, it's a data library that allows developers to, to use Unicode and make, make life easier for, for them and also for us as writers. It's got all the, all the glyphs, all those like components, but, and more, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit. Okay, so in terms of plurals, what's supported, we can have a variety of different cases. You have a zero, a singular, a dual, a few, many, and other. So how does this look like in my example? Instead of two strings, if we're using an ICU format, we can put everything into a single string of text. Now, what does this mean? It means that it makes the product better because it's gonna allow all of the languages to have the correct uh, number of strings that they, they require to get the message across. And it also helps with uh, developer velocity because they don't need to add anything to the code. ICU makes sure everything works just based on the, the condition of the number. This is just to show you what it looks like in the translation management system. So for Spanish, you have your singular and plural. And Polish, it automatically does this and knows to break it apart into the four different versions, with, complete with the, the rules. Uh, but ICU is more than just a library of glyphs and plural rules. It also includes select arguments, so you can customize messages depending on a specific category, like gender. You can, it includes formats for dates and times, just like Rachel was showing the different date formats in the UK and, and US. All that stuff is also contained within this data library. And also translations of common things like languages, countries, currencies, months, days, and, and much more. It's a very powerful tool. Mind blowing. And I really recommend, if this is new to you, or even if it's not new to you, to, to talk to the developers you work with about this, because they're either gonna be, this is gonna be new to them as well, and it's gonna help their work, or you'll blow their mind because you're talking to them in a language they speak. Which segues nicely to my final part, which is about open dialogue, and creating a, a judgment-free atmosphere where everyone can share, ask questions, and offer feedback. Um, so going back to, to my work on the Wix dashboard and the languages that I work with, the 21 other languages, that's 21 other writers who are reading my words, who are trying to poke holes in it, who are asking me questions, who are raising issues. Um, and as the sole writer on my team, the more people I can get reading my, my words and, and giving me feedback, the better. Um, but it doesn't just happen like that. Uh, you kind of have to create this environment where people are willing to, to be open and share with you. Uh, this is an example from my ADI days. Um, so while we were working on localizing these million plus words into languages, there was a lot of issues in the English. There were questions being raised. Sometimes, you know, dozens of questions at a time. And so we kind of turned it into a joke. Uh, I think a Korean translator first wrote something like, Dear Kevin, sorry for causing a concern. And so every time someone would open an issue or they were like, felt like I was being a little, getting a little agitated, they would put this on, put a smile on our face, it became an inside joke. And you know, in the end, it was about improving and making the product as best as possible. And if there were corrections that needed to happen in English, so be it. And so there was no hesitation in anyone bringing it up because we made it light. Uh, these are also some of the great people that I worked with from the ADI team. A lot of people will notice uh, some of them. Um, but 
this, this slide is just to show you that it's not just about work, it's also about the personal connection. You know, we work together, but we also were able to have fun together. And by having that personal bond, it, it just allows, you know, there's no issue of time zones or long distances. You have this connection with someone and you feel the comfort that, okay, if something's up, if something's not right, I, I feel freed and comfort, confident enough to, to say it. So here are the main takeaways I hope uh, you, you can take away from this, uh, this talk. First is that you should know the journey your content makes so that you can stay in the driver's seat throughout the process. Uh, you should try and create and maintain sources of content truth. You know, I, and, and experiment with this. Try things in a sheet or try things on a Monday board. Whatever you want to do, see what works for you. But always iterate, just like your, your words. Try changing it and optimizing it till you find what's right. Uh, internationalization and ICU. So just, you don't need to, you know, go and you can. You can go read all about it online and, and dive in. But really just understanding that it's there and what it can do will help you know the limits and the possibilities of what you can do with your words. And last, it's all about the human connection. You know, if you're working with a, someone in localization that's remote and far away, have some kind of dialogue, but don't just stick to the work. Stick, you know, ask them how they're doing, ask them about their family, ask them what they like to do. And I, I guarantee you that will help in the professional relationship as well. Thank you.